All right, guys, welcome back to the Social Standard Podcast. I am very excited about our guest today. Uh, we've got Brian Garofalo, who is the CMO of Igloo Products Corp. Uh, I know them more as Igloo Coolers, which is probably what a lot of people know you guys famously for. Um, but I'm excited to talk about the cooler space today, oddly enough, because I feel like it has been, it's really had an interesting last kind of couple of years. So um, Brian, welcome. What's up? How are you? Hey, thank you very much for having me. I am doing very good today. Very cool. Are you in California? I am. Yeah. So okay. Igloo is actually headquartered in Katy, Texas, right outside of Houston. Uh, but I am in a satellite office down in Southern California. Nice. Okay. That that probably informs a lot of your content too, I can tell. So certainly does. Very cool. All right. Well, like I was saying, you know, I think the cooler industry has had a pretty big sort of revamp in the last couple of years. Um, you know, you have your very established brands like the Igloo, like the Coleman. Those are my memories from childhood when it comes to coolers and outdoor activities. Um, but then, you know, a few years ago, you had, you know, some challenger brands come in like a Yeti, like an Arctic Zone and a few others. And so that has really, I think, pushed this industry in a lot of different ways, which has been all for the better. Um, and certainly while I was doing my research for this podcast, I noticed that Igloo has done some very cool trends. Um, you know, you've got 90 stuff, you're hitting all of the sustainability stuff. It's, you guys are doing a lot of really cool, very interesting things. So I'm excited to dive into all of that. But I want to talk a little bit about you and your background and kind of like what led you to Igloo and how are you taking the, these trends and really sort of making a spot for Igloo? Uh, sure. Would love to talk about all that. And first off, thank you. I mean, you make us sound really, really great. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a lot of hard work from a lot of people, but definitely sure. uh, feel like we're headed in the right direction as well. Um I guess to to dive right in here a little bit about me and my background. Uh, so I've, I've been a brand guy and an e-commerce person for about 20 years now. Uh, I've always been in Southern California and actually spent the majority of my career in the action sports industry, which is skateboarding, surfing, snowboarding. Uh, so down, down here in Orange County, uh, we're right by the John Wayne Airport. Uh, kind of the area here in coastal cities are known as uh, the Velcro Valley. So this mm -hmm. is where the surfboard industry really started in 80s, 90s, uh, and it's the global epicenter of the action sports business. So I've, I've had the, the good pleasure of working for some really great brands and then being able to lead some marketing organizations and, and e-com operations at brands that a lot of your listeners have probably heard of, like okay. DC Shoes, mm -hmm. uh, Ruka, a lot of people know Ruka oh, yeah. as RVCA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Element Skateboards, they're all part of uh, the Board Riders organization now. Okay. Uh, and so at the end of the day, you know, it's been a lot of brand building experience, global audience to a young niche customer who's very passionate about, uh, you know, their their activities that turn into lifestyles for them. Uh, so I'm not somebody who surfs, but I'm a surfer and my entire world revolves around that. I'm not a, somebody who skateboards, but I'm a skateboarder and all my music, art and fashion are informed by what I do with skateboarding and my, my peer group there. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I ended up uh, going through a couple different uh, rounds of consolidation in the industry and kind of got a taste of the private equity world. Yeah. Uh, I actually did a startup and spent quite a bit of time in San Francisco, uh, raised, raised money and did a, a tech startup as a mobile app to allow people to customize apparel and accessories. Cool. Um, so yeah, I really jumped into mobile commerce, um, user acquisition, all, all kinds of fun stuff like that. And then it ended up leading me back to, um, back to consumer goods just in general. Uh, so I ended up here about three years ago. Uh, through network. So a great friend of mine and mentor actually sold a business to Igloo. Mm -hmm. uh, and exactly like you were talking about, uh, they started this journey on uh, really shifting the entire brand from more of a housewares business and a manufacturing led operation to a lifestyle business and yeah. really being consumer centric and marrying target consumers, usage occasions with what do we need to go build that people want versus just need. Uh, and I was somebody that they tapped to go help lead that transformation and also our direct to consumer business, which 
igrecoolers.com was really an information portal up to three years ago, and now we've turned it into uh, a very profitable and uh, very fast growing hmm. distribution channel. Very cool. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that you said there that I really liked is you just talking about how you're shifting it from a production company basically to or like a manufacturing company to a lifestyle. I think that's so crucial today. And I think especially the younger generations are looking to identify with certain lifestyles, not necessarily certain brands. And that's becoming ever more important, right? You even look at, at brands can now be influencers, which is a conversation we have a lot with, a, with several of our clients is you don't have to you don't just have to work with influencers. You need to be an influencer. You need to influence the culture. You need to be passionate. You need to have a voice in that, in that capacity. And from what I've seen, you guys have done a really great job. And that, that's no small feat um, to go from like having not much of a voice, kind of being like in the background to like being right in the forefront. So, I mean, how has that process been? Yeah, well, well again, thank you very much. I mean, we put a lot of <laughs> effort uh, a, a ton of work on on strategy and then and sure. then turning plans into action with doing exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you know, we have this incredible advantage that we actually are a manufacturer uh, and we're domestic manufacturer. Mm -hmm, uh, so now huge. that we're, yeah, now what, what you mentioned earlier um, about challenger brands coming in, mm -hmm. I mean, the key word there is brands and yeah. the kind of the legacy uh, companies have been focused on manufacturing and distribution and, and mass channels, but the lessons learned are, hey, when you're a brand and you can have a relationship that's emotional with a consumer, now we're talking about more trust, we're talking about, uh, you know, the ability to win repeat purchases and loyalty, and then we're also talking about, quite frankly, profit. Uh, mm -hmm. So with these challenger brands, there has been a, a pretty significant white space created in price point uh, mm -hmm. where we've done a very aggressive job at going to storytell and fill that gap from a lower price up to the higher price uh, with new unique features and benefits and most importantly, stories. So the, the journey you're talking about, I think one place to, uh, you know, we could really point to is what we've done with sustainability. So we consider ourselves the most environmentally friendly cooler company in the world. And when you're talking about leading in an industry, uh, we are the first company to introduce a uh, biodegradable, compostable, recyclable cooler. And we specifically did that to go head to head against EPS foam single use coolers that are very bad for the environment. Sure. We've never been in that business. We've never made or distributed those, but as a leader in the category, we felt like it's our responsibility to offer the consumer an environmentally responsible solution. And then that led us down this incredible path where uh, we've, we've actually retooled the entire foam insulation formula for millions and millions of coolers that we make every single year to be hmm. much more environmentally sensitive and much more so than anything out there uh, on the market for many of our competitors. This year, we released the world's first recycled resin plastic cooler collection that you can find in REI. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's been another really cool first where we take uh, basically milk jugs and yogurt cups post-consumer, uh, clean, grind, turn into resin, and then reproduce uh, coolers with that plastic. And we've done the same thing with PET water bottles for soft side coolers to make fabric. Uh, we've been able to recycle over 2 million water bottles and turn them into the fabric we use for soft side coolers in wow. only a year. Wow. Wow. That's pretty yeah. incredible. I mean, it's almost <laughs> like you guys are sort of like the Patagonia of coolers, right? <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, yeah. when you talk about when you talk about brands as influencers, obviously everybody's mind would immediately go to Patagonia because they they've done such a phenomenal job uh, with. I mean, everything from being a B Corp to being mm -hmm. uh, uh, leading with cause marketing and saying, "Hey, yes, we make uh, T-shirts and jackets, but we're here and we exist for this reason." And so many of their their fans. Uh, spend a lot of money with them oh, sure. because of the ethos rather than this is this sweatshirt fits me better than any sweatshirt right, or right yeah it, <laughs> and it's certainly yeah. not the cheapest option out there right so you you want to feel yeah, good about what you're exactly. doing and, and you know voting with your dollars so to speak so, yep, well, so, very that, much so. 
that leads me to an interesting question here because what, I mean, myself, I'm very, you know, eco-conscious like that you're speaking my language hundred percent. Right. Um, but I also know that millennials and Gen Z, you know, there's a lot of pushback out there because they say that they want sustainability, um, eco-friendly products, but then you also have the boom of brands like Shein or forever 21, right. Any of these fast fashion brands that are definitely not eco-friendly. So, you know, my question to you would be, well, A, first of all, congrats for doing that. Cause I think that's huge. No matter if, you know, people care or not, I think it's important, but two, it's, you know, do you see the younger generations walking that walk or are they just talking it? Right. And that would turn uh, into like sales. Like, are they actually buying them? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I usually tend to shy away from, uh, from generalizations, sure. uh, I love dealing in facts because I'm a data person and it's kind of the, the nature of the beast being a being an e-com operator. Sure. Uh, so I, I tend to look at channels of distribution and end consumer use cases. So in the in the big picture, what I do see happening is uh, back to your point is people voting with their dollars. Mm -hmm. So we tend to find in the marketplace today, uh, people that want to vote with their dollars behind what they say about themselves mm -hmm. is very distribution channel specific. Mm -hmm. So that means for us, uh, I'm going to find you as the consumer, most likely on igloocoolers.com because it's fairly easy for me to go find somebody that, uh, that has uh, the interest in the brands that you have, that has the type of ethos that you have as a consumer. When you're shopping for a cooler in spring or summer and you're looking for something with an eco message, you're gonna come across us because uh, we're gonna go seek you out. Sure. Outside of that, uh, we find that today, the people that are willing to pay the premium it costs for that product are usually found in specialty distribution like REI. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we introduced that recycled resin cooler, uh, we work with them as a partner and they're a phenomenal partner. They're already servicing the consumer that wants that product and was willing to pay more for it. Mm -hmm. We have uh, significant interest from lots of other uh, channels of distribution that have uh, a broader reach, uh, but we inevitably end up in the pricing discussion. Uh, so there's the pricing discussion from our retail partner, also the pricing discussion on behalf of the consumer. And that's where you end up seeing macro trends like mm -hmm. uh, price elasticity. Uh, so there, there's a lot of other conversations that go into something and, you know, the amount of retail shelf space and zero sum game of if we're going to put something on a shelf, we've got to take something else off and how are we going to trade dollars? Uh, big picture, yes, it's an issue. Small picture, match the product, the price, the consumer, the distribution channel. As of today, we find most people, young, old, millennials, uh, Gen Z, boomers, that have that same ethos, they're buying it direct to consumer or in a place like REI, we do see consumer shifts happening. Okay. So my hope is you'll be able to find products like this uh, in places like, uh, gosh, Target, Dick Sporting Goods, Walmart in the near term future. Yeah. Well, and I know your bio biodegradable cooler is already for sale on Target, right? So I saw it there yeah, and a few weekends ago. Yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal win for us. It says a lot about the retailer and the consumer. So Target actually made the hardline stance that they are not selling EPS foam chain wide nationally. Wow. So you do see um, some politics come into play because there are a lot of uh, cities, counties, and then states that have just straight up banned uh, single use plastic products. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so. Yeah, they, you know, you can go to a place like Santa Monica and not be able to get a plastic straw when you're going right. out to eat. Okay. Um, but for for Target, when they're looking on a national scale, they understand that, you know, change is coming. So they're not going to be able to sell those products five to 10 years from now. And why don't they be on the leading edge and say, here's a better solution. Um, so we're going to offer this today everywhere. Uh, yeah, we love it. Yeah, I think I think it's smart, and I think the 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 customer at Target 
is maybe a little bit more in line with, with that anyway. Right. I mean, I think that's, that makes sense. And I know I personally, I used to live in Santa Monica and actually we just opened um, a Nashville office at the end of last year. So I moved out here to do that. And one of the first things I noticed is you go to the grocery store and you get plastic bags. I mean, my jaw right. almost hit the floor because this was, this has been, you know, this has been outlawed for like ever in Santa Monica. And I just, you know, I hadn't really considered that that wasn't the case everywhere else. So um, I think you're, you're more like niche distribution channels. That makes perfect sense to me. But what popped into my head when you were talking about the direct to consumer angle, I mean, have, how long have you been able to buy coolers from Igloo on their site? Uh, on your so, site? Right. E E-commerce started here about 2017, okay. uh, it became a strategic priority for the company in 2019. Gotcha. I mean, and so that that's probably single-handedly had the biggest effect on you guys being able to change some of the product visions for some of your things then, right? To, to what you're saying, because I mean, I guess maybe that's, maybe that's too broad, right? Like I would think about social media, digital advertising, all of these things that you can actually target a very specific audience and get them to your site to buy where this audience may or may not be at, you know, a, like a, a Walmart of sorts, right? Maybe because like for me, I, I was never a Walmart shopper before I was here because there wasn't one in Santa Monica. There's barely mm -hmm. a, tar a target, right? And there was an REI though. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But but look, it, it's interesting when I when I talk about our broader distribution and larger product mix uh, for the environmentally sustainable specific products. Like we've had the most success offering a breadth of product and an entire merchandise collection in REI. Our first significant retail win with the category was the single SKU of that recool product, which is the biodegradable cooler mm -hmm. at Target. Uh, so huh. we actually we actually sold through, I mean, exponentially more of those units in Target retail doors than we did on our own direct consumer site. How interesting! And, well, that that is a more cost effective solution, right? Versus buying a hard cooler. Yes, absolutely, and also the nature of e commerce too. I mean, we're we offer free shipping to our consumers on igloocoolers.com when they meet a minimum ship right. or a cost threshold of $75. And that's a, it's literally a $7 cooler. Yeah. Uh, and then just broad reach and distribution of target when we launched the product uh, with a, a pretty significant media event at the beginning of our whole good market strategy, the entire story was go buy this product at target. Makes sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. I think, I think it's, I think it's a genius move. I mean, I, I haven't had any styrofoam in my house and I don't know how long, but the biodegradable, I think it's, it's so necessary because sometimes you just, you just can't, right. You just, <laughs> there are just too many things and you need something yep. that's a little bit, a little bit easier. So, um, I think it's a great move and, and you guys have done so many things even outside of the eco-friendly sort of push, right? I mean, the partnerships that I've seen you guys do, you've got nineties retros coolers. I saw a little partnership with yes way Rose, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, you've got this, the skate and the surf culture. So as far as like pushing a, a lifestyle, it's that voice is coming out very strong on your social channels, which is obviously where, where I focus. Cause that's where I live. Right. Yep. Um, but I mean, talk to me about some of those partnerships. Like how do you, how did you, when you, when you came in, I assume you guys weren't doing any sort of branded coolers. There were no grateful dead coolers, right? There was no nineties retro. Like yep. how, how did you steer that ship and how did you figure out the right partnerships, um, to create that voice in that culture. Oh, so I, I think first off, I feel like I'm going to sell you a lot of coolers today. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I feel I feel myself buying them. So you're absolutely right. <laughs> well, this is this is perfect. I mean, we talk about it all the time. Our our job in the marketing group is to make people want coolers mm -hmm. when a lot of times people are buying products in our category because they need them. Right. Uh, so we're, we're doing a lot with incremental sales and that happens with emotional connections. So outside of our environmental uh, or our uh, environmentally sustainable product stories, mm -hmm. um, one, we have the, this phenomenal advantage that we're a 75 year old brand. So we have an incredible archive of content. Uh, we also have this phenomenal archive of product and we're authentic and real when we say a, a retro story and a retro message. We're not a brand yeah. new company that throws a colorway or, you know, comes up with a funny story. We literally took product that we made in 1992, 
and made it on the same machines with the same molds in the same colors. We even used some of the same content and brought it back and said, here's our retro collection. But then we started playing with it and updating, you know, here's a new product on a, in a soft side cooler that didn't exist then, but it merchandises really well with, um, with the same collection. So authenticity is our opportunity there that nobody else in, um, in our space has the ability to authentically tell a message like that. And then just it's fashion, right? So it's a place and a time. It, it's very impactful with the market today. We literally have consumers that it's like a, you know, a mother and a daughter that have the same cooler from 1992 and 2020 that they reissued and they remember being in the car on the road trip in the mid nineties with the same cooler and it's still in mom's garage and they both bought it and they're both holding it up on a picture on Instagram. It's awesome. So that's super cool for us to be able to be authentic uh, and tell that story and it's working really well. Uh, and then uh, the licensing and partnership business. So this is, uh, I think the way I've seen this work really, really well in consumer goods is when you actually have an iconic product to be able to tell a product story on. So when you are, uh, you know, when your sneaker company of du jour, sneaker company of the day that starts today, uh, well, here's, here's a good example. Uh, I think they're getting there, but somebody like Allbirds. So they have a, they have a material story. Yep. But their their silhouette, oh, it's it's not that amazing. But when you look at when you think about licensing and how to tell a story with product like the Air Force One mm -hmm. or the um, the sorry, I got somebody coming to say hello. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you have a product like that that is an iconic silhouette that people know and love, and now you marry that with a partnership or a licensing story like it works mm -hmm. uh, we just so happen to have the playmate cooler which yeah. is the best-selling cooler of all time um, again it's a it's this authentic heritage story it's 50 years old that's the handheld uh, the handheld one right yep, kind of flips. correct yeah yeah so it has the the tent top design so it's single hand carry it's a personal cooler uh, you can recognize it from a mile away it's a you know, everybody knows the red base and the white top. Yep. Um, so we take that iconic design um, and then we look at basically three factors. So one, uh, you know, foundational brand building stuff that we did when kind of my my generation of Igloo marketing came here, uh, brand positioning. Mm -hmm. So uh, what what do we think about ourselves? What, are, what do we want our consumers to think about us? Uh, and we have a, a very simple brand positioning statement. We call it FADA, F-A-D-A. -A. We're fun, American, durable, and accessible. And each one of those things has lots of qualifiers to it, but that's a lens. Okay. So if we're going to go partner with somebody, um, do they align with our brand position? And then two is our core consumers. So same thing, uh, you know, we went in and looked at data and who's buying our products. And then we looked at who's aspirational to us, who do we want to buy our products. We have four key consumer groups that have a lot of qualifiers to them. Sure. So one, does a partner fit with our brand position? Two, is a partner going to speak to somebody in one of our core consumer groups? And then three, as a cooler company, we've identified six categories of partnerships and licenses that we want to go attack. Okay. And it's, uh, you know, they're fairly basic, but it tells us kind of the, the rule book of who we would work with, who we wouldn't sure. work with. So we do uh, sports. Mm -hmm. So we have an NFL license, a NASCAR license, and a couple cool brand builders in there. Uh, we do action sports. So surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding, that's where you see some of those companies. We do media. Uh, so that's things like Disney, Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, Scooby-Doo. Uh, that works really well with a mystery <laughs> machine on a, yep. on a Playmate cooler. Um, mm -hmm. We do music. So there's your Grateful Dead. Yep. Uh, but we're very selective about who the bands and artists are. Uh, and then we have what we call culture. So that's our, uh, you know, fashion and anybody, uh, you know, influencers, things like that, that align, mm -hmm. align with our brand and food and beverage. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense with coolers that you would put a beer in it. Um, so we work with a lot of people in the uh, alcohol space, non-alcohol space, uh, QSR space, all, all those types of things. So that's basically our formula. 
Uh, so you take an iconic product. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, out there wants to mirror our formula, uh, you build a product, wait 50 years <laughs> until it becomes iconic. Uh, <laughs> Align, align those partnerships with brand positioning, core consumer groups, categories that we want to work with. Uh, and then we have a phenomenal team that has a ton of experience in the licensing and partnership business that goes and uh, creates uh, all of our deals, uh, works on our go-to-market process of what the story is we're going to tell, how we're going to tell it, uh, and then goes and executes. And we see incredible success everywhere from uh, you know the Grateful Dead to Hello Kitty to yeah. Iron Maiden. <laughs> Last okay. week we we launched Hello Kitty product. This today we're literally launching an Iron Maiden playmate. So it's I love it's it. Super super fun and funny. The the broad spectrum of consumers we could talk to. Yeah, well, and I mean I think that's what's so great about being a an iconic brand, right? Is you can speak to a lot of different people and hit a lot of different targets and. The thing that's so interesting to me is that when you look at the e-commerce space right now, it's dominated by these new DTC brands. And when I say dominated, I think I mean like there's a lot of press, a lot of buzz. This is kind of the new flashy thing. And I think it's really great to see a brand that has been around for a long time, almost sort of like breathe fresh air into itself and say, no, like we actually, we can do the same thing, right? We're just as smart. We're just as bold. We're just as good as all of these new flashy brands. Um, I think that's a pretty interesting point uh, to, or at least a, a good point of pride, I would think for your team um, as you're looking at, you know, how to, how to stay hip. Yep. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, e-commerce at the end of the day is, is fairly simple. Like mm -hmm. you, you have to have phenomenal product and phenomenal customer and consumer service for people to want to buy from you and then to continue to come back and buy from you. But at the end of the day, it's building trust with consumers. And then, uh, I mean, this is, this is an optimization game. So everybody's yeah. got the same rule book. They've got the same tools, whether you're a startup that's going to exist tomorrow, or mm -hmm. you're a brand like us that's been around for 75 years. I look at it and say, Hey, we actually have an advantage because we've got people that are just as smart as everybody else, but we have a brand that has 75 years of history. So there's yeah. a lot of catch up for us to do. Uh, we have a lot of organic search. We have the most brand awareness in the category. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of emotional connection with people in the media that when we have good stories to tell, they want to tell our stories uh, sure. and they'll do that before a startup company that's just a me too brand. Uh, so a lot of advantages to be us, uh, which is, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but, and you also don't get yourself pigeonholed as like my dad's cooler, right. In like a, <laughs> in like a not cool, not fun way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that all, that all comes down to where, where we want to want to go invest our resources, okay. where we're going to invest our, our time, money, and people and new product development, and then our, our marketing and communications. Yeah, totally. Now, how do you think about, I mean, you know, e-commerce obviously is a huge part of the equation, but a lot of what gets people to the site nowadays is, you know, social media, all the, all those sort of ads. So what, I guess as a CMO, where, where has the trend gone for you? Like when you're spending your day, you know, a little while ago versus, you know, today, how much does social media come up in conversation? How much of it is kind of takes your brain power for that, for that one day? Yeah. I think anybody who's sitting in my seat, you know, obviously it comes up every single day. Um, but we have to look, um, we have to look long-term and we have to think about every single one of our communications tactics strategically. So how, how does it play into the bigger picture of the brand? For me, I think I, I have a little bit of a unique uh, job as a CMO where my team also owns the direct consumer function of mm -hmm. e-commerce sales with igloocoolers.com. So I look at social media two ways. Uh, one is brand building and two is revenue driving. Uh, the revenue driving part is really easy and I can look at social media uh, very, very tactically sure. and formulaic. Of if I put a piece of content out, here's my scoreboard. And this is how many people uh, were served uh, an ad or a social media message. This is how much engagement we got. This is a click through rate. This is a conversion rate from traffic from that channel, which equaled this much revenue and this much profit. So 
right there, I can easily put a formula against something of if I spend X, I'll get Y in return. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the whole other side of that is brand building. So, right. uh, you know, just a few years ago, our social media fan base literally did not exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we put all this work into building our connections with our fans and followers and investing in a lot of content and we found where we got the most engagement and where our brand voice really started to flourish is being fun uh people love seeing licensed product messages from us the partnership stuff they love hearing eco messages they love the retro stuff oh yeah absolutely on a, on a channel like instagram mm -hmm. we can have a voice basically as a meme company Yep. talking about coolers and keeping stuff cold and fun. Like it's a, it's a scroll stop, right? Like, are we going to give somebody 10 seconds of their day to smile and laugh? Uh, that's worth following you and being a part of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, so that's incredibly important to us in building the platform of fans and followers and then building engagement of delivering them really fun and funny content that gives them a reason to want to buy one of our products, want to share something about us with friends and family uh, and be here for the long haul versus just like, you know, take a step back and objectively like, why on earth would you follow a cooler company? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, memes, but, memes will make you follow anyone. That's for sure. Literally. But and the, then there's the magic, right? Of uh, memes for consumer goods is, how how do we use the platform and create the content that are going to make people laugh uh, but also have it from the point of view of the cooler company yep uh, yeah so it's you know uh it's a cooler salesman looking at summer coming and it's the guy in the yellow blazer <laughs> hiding behind a tree you know licking his one. chops <laughs> like yeah it's it's funny and it makes sense and you know what yeah. I actually want a new cooler because I'm going to have my first backyard barbecue in a year and a half because it got yeah. taken away from me last year. So, you exactly. know, it was exactly. funny. I'm going to, I'll I'm going to give them my hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. I think, you know, throughout the process when I was looking at, you know, what you guys were doing, I was actually sort I, I thought, you know what, when, when we get on this podcast, I'm going to have to tell Brian that we got to change up the targeting a little bit, because I have to tell you, if I had been targeted with some igloo ads, right, I'm not seeking out igloo coolers on Instagram because I don't know you guys are there, right? right. I, I seek you out on Target because I know you're there and I figured that stuff out. But had I been served an ad for these 90s retro coolers, or honestly, even was it the Trailblazer? Is that the, the rolling cooler? The, the trail mate. Yeah. So I'll make it. Yeah. Like those two coolers, had I been served an ad for that done, I think I would have at least two <laughs> coolers right now. So <laughs> we got it. We got to right. figure, we got to figure that aspect out. I don't know what my stats Something. are on social, but, um, target all no, of don't. the, all the Jess Phillipses on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, don't don't worry, series listening. The next time you go back to Instagram, you'll you'll get some ads from us. <laughs> I know it's, it's already it's already done. It's, so you know, my I guess I have two I have two more questions for you if you'll bear with me here. So, um, you know, you think about and if you're keeping tabs on like creator economy and like all of a sudden influencers are getting like respect that we think that they should have been getting respect for for many years, but it's happened. It's here. We're happy about it. You know, a lot of them are launching their own brands and partnerships have been something that people have done forever. So have you guys thought about teaming up and doing, you know, a certain influencer and making them their own igloo sort of license and branded cooler? Is that something you guys would ever do? 100% yes. Uh, so I, I'm on, I'm on your side with this. I, I absolutely love the idea of uh, people as brands. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at social media and me as a consumer and take, take me away from Igloo, like I want to go follow people who I think are interesting and content that I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, I think, platform agnostic. If you're a brand, a person, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever it might, a, a band, something like yeah. that. Like people individually usually are more attractive to people when they have something to say. Uh, so I, I look at that and say, oh, absolutely. Individuals can be, and oftentimes are more powerful than brands with their voice and sure. certainly media platforms. 
like everybody knows, you know, there's, uh, you know, a media company is either publicly traded or owned by one person who has a lot to do with the narrative of what's coming out from that media outlet. But if I know, you know, this social influencer, or maybe it's an, an athlete or a musician or whoever it is that I admire, uh, both personally, professionally, or just think they're cool, like I trust them. So I Absolutely. want, I want to hear what they have to say. I follow them for a reason. I feel like I'm part of the club when they're putting out content and I'm the one who's consuming it first. So yes. And then I would say, uh, you know, we've already done it. So okay. we've, we've certainly worked with a lot of individuals to release sure. product, uh, to phenomenal success. Uh, so what, what we find as a brand is, uh, when we look at that spectrum of partnerships, you've got a great partner or um, a co-marketing partner on mm -hmm. one end of the spectrum, and then you've sure. got a very strict license arrangement on the other side. And the more we can swing the pendulum to the partnership side where we're doing things like creating content together, distributing content together, uh, working on a go-to-market plan together, distributing product together, uh, we always have more success and more engagement and we sell product at a much higher velocity. Uh, and those partners can be incredibly small or incredibly large. And the price tag can be incredibly small or incredibly large, but it's all about a sense of scale. Uh, so this is where you know, the e-commerce hat comes on of yeah. thinking about optimization. If somebody has a platform that's this size and engagement that this much, and they're going to drive this much traffic, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line, like I, I'm not really concerned if it's a small price tag or a high price tag. I'm only concerned on the return on investment. Sure. And I, as the CMO who also does uh, e-commerce, I, I have the luxury of that return is measured both tangibly by uh, profit and how many new consumers we win and intangibly by the brand building activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, and influencers are now, especially with all of the tools that social platforms have given them. They're not just brand awareness people anymore, right? They're driving an outrageous amount of sales. Um, yep. And I, they've always driven it. I think it's just a little bit more trackable now than it used yep. to be. So yeah, we've got, we've got uh, more trustworthy attribution tools now than we've yes. ever had, uh, mm -hmm. which is a huge advantage for, for me and my team. Oh, absolutely. I think for everybody it's, and it makes our job a lot easier too, right? We don't have to sit here and nope. say, here are the five reasons you should be using influencers. People just know nope. now I've got to be using them to be, you know, a part of pop culture um, at, mm -hmm. at a very minimum. And then to, you know, especially for a lot of any of the DTC brands, when you own those metrics, it's just, it's gangbusters. So that's super cool. Um, all right. Well, I have one more question for you. Um, and this is, this is a fun one. We ask everyone who comes on the show, give me one influencer. It doesn't have to be digital necessarily, but anyone who would call an influencer who you follow and sort of like, you know, if, if they promoted a product today, you would buy it. All right. I I'm guessing it's going to be skate or, or <laughs> surf is, is my, yeah. um, is my guess, right? Is it Kelly uh, Slater? Yeah. I was going to say, I apologize. I, I don't have a canned answer prepared for this, but <laughs> I have, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of, different tastes out there and, and all the different things personally that I'm into. So, sure. um, let's see, yeah, actually me. some, yeah, somebody that I love, uh, he goes by, uh, by Mark Aru on, okay. on Instagram. So he's the lead singer of the band Midland. Nice. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, we've been able to work with them before, okay. uh, but he's somebody that I just, I'm a huge fan of outside of being friends but love the music also love the lifestyle uh, and he is incredibly talented musician but uh, also a uh, very talented surfer and also really cares about the environment both uh, the planet and socially people around him so super cool guy uh, and when uh, when he talks about products uh, i love discovering things from somebody like him yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's how I discover almost everything is from influencers. So, and it's funny that he, um, 
he hits almost every single topic that we've talked about um, today, right? In terms of Igla's ethos. So yeah. <laughs> it's it, everything, everything funnels right down the path for you, which is, is pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> so well, well played there. <laughs> but um, well, Brian, it was really great to have you on. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. I learned a ton. So um, I hope that, you know, I hope that we can continue the conversation later. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, absolutely, feelings mutual, appreciate it. And I uh, always love learning from people like yourself as well. Cool. All right. Thank you.